such a privilege to be here, uh, such a privilege to be able to uh, share in a context like this. Uh, it's a bit overwhelming. Uh, time, uh, Chris said, would you like to share tomorrow? And uh, thanks for them. I didn't have a restful night or sleep, but uh, just wrestling with uh, wrestling with, with 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 what to share in a context like this. Because I'm aware that there's guys that have have done more than me. I'm, I'm aware that there's guys who have uh, have planted more than I planted. Um, but I do believe God has given me something. Um, I do believe that God's put something on my heart for, for us. It's no longer for you. I've come to equipped before and it's been uh, be able to preach and leave something that maybe you can process and then leave and go off. I'm not leaving and going anywhere. I'm in this with you. Um, and uh, I know I might sound a little bit weird, but I'm trusting that uh, the full transformation happens and I speak with an American accent or... A, a version of it in New York or whatever that looks like, but uh, for now you just have to put up with the South Africanisms and the South African as much as I am. But um, I'm speaking on the other side of where, where, where Ron was speaking from. Is uh, I, 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 as you can see, I'm still young and uh, I haven't haven't been serving God for 50 years. I've even been alive for 50 years. But um, I'm speaking from the perspective of of hearing God call you. And trying to figure out what that looks like. You're in God, God's commissioning or saying, go and, and plant a church. And, and sitting there saying, well, I've grown up in NCMI. I, my dad was part of Cornerstone when I was two years old. All I know is NCMI, all I know is going to the nations. And then I get told that equipped that we don't plant NCMI churches. So I'm like, so what do I plant then? What does it look like? like how, do we, how do we practically do this? It's okay to respond. But then what happens? And I, I found myself uh, reading books, which is apparently wrong, so I'm not going to do it anymore. <laughs> I'm admitting my sin. Um, <laughs> but I, I found myself looking around to, to, to figure out what does it mean to, to plant? What does it look like? I, how can you be effective? And, and, and you know as much as I do that there are thousands of these books and there's thousands of these organizations. There's thousands of these, these groups that you can become part of in that. And uh, I, I had to wrestle through something of, of what, what do I believe in? What, what do I hold true? What is God saying to me? And it led me down a journey that um, because I get to preach, you get to be part of it. So this might fill your heart with faith. It might just be rehashing something that's been said. But I'm hoping that it ignites something in your heart, like, like Ron said, to, to light a flame for the king and for his kingdom. Now, that's, just, that's just something that we've thrown out. But uh, as I've searched through this, that has become a, a grounding reality that I'm trying to see work out. And um, the, the, the sort of the, the, the framework that I'm going to be working in is um, at the beginning of the year, I found myself in the book of Joshua. I didn't want to just start a, uh, a reading plan because I knew by the 3rd of, December, uh, the 3rd of January, that's it, finished. Uh, and I'm just dealing with guilt and insecurity and all of that. So I've been working through the book of Joshua. And it's been significant for me because I've, the more I've dug into it, the more I've, I've tried to process uh, these stories and these scriptures, I've realized that the book of Joshua, as much as it is a historical book and it's those historical stories, there is huge spiritual ramifications in how we need to live our lives. And, uh, and it's been something that has shaped the way I'm Thinking about the future is something that, I, that has shaped uh, sort of what I'm expecting God to do and sort of what I'm dreaming for, and I'm, I'm bringing you on that journey with me. I, uh, a couple of years back, I, can't, I think it was 2018, um, myself and my wife had the privilege of going to New York when we felt like this was something that God's doing. I remember sitting on the train, because we feel like God's called us to Queens, and we were going into Queens, and I remember looking around at these people and being like, How? How? Like weird people ride the subway. Just go into Instagram and you can see a whole bunch of them. But I said, God, how am I going to reach these people when I probably have 1% of my life in common with them and that's we're both humans? We probably got totally different likes, totally different cultures, totally different ways of doing things. And I, I kept on going, Lord, how am I going to reach these people? How are we going to do this? How are we going to plant a church? And I felt like God rebuked me and brought me back to this. He said, if, I, if, if Jesus came to teach my kingdom, 
and the Holy Spirit has been poured out to help establish the kingdom, why should you do something different? And suddenly it dawned on me that, yes, and, and it might go against something that you believe in, and that's fine. This is me sharing my journey. But something secured in me that, that actually Jesus and his kingdom is good enough. Yeah. People ask me, how are you going to plant the church? I've got no idea. I know God's called me. The biggest hurdle was to get to America. I've got no idea, but I know who I'm going for. I know what I need to preach, and I know what I need to declare. So I've got the message, I've got the, the calling, I've got the, 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 the obsessed about Jesus. I don't know, how, I don't know if I'm going to start in my, in, my, in my lines. I don't know if we're going to rent a building. I don't know any of that. But I know we're going. I know we're going because of Jesus. I know we're going to declare his kingdom. And uh, that's with what God was saying through Joshua has been some of the, the framework of what this comes from. And um, you know, Joshua is this amazing book and uh, I've just found where you are, you start preaching a lot of series of oh, sermons about, about these things. And for me, what, what stood out is this, this, the Israelites are free and Joshua is commissioned and he's, he's at this moment of seeing God's amazing miracle of, of crossing over the Jordan and he's at the brink of the promised land. And there's, 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 there's a, a, a whole bunch of people that he needs to conquer in order, to, in, order to, in order to lay hold of the kingdom of God. And something significant happens in, in, in chapter 4. And uh, I'm not going to unpack that entirely. You can go read that. Um, but uh, what, do, what do stones mean to you? And Joshua stops and he, and he makes an altar. He makes an altar in the middle of the, of the river. And he makes one at the river. And something significant as I was processing this was... God, what, what is the point of it? What is the point of an altar? You know, what is the point of all these things? And the, the challenge I came from, and the challenge I've brought, brought out for this, is we often suffer from spiritual forgetfulness. We often suffer from forgetting what God has done. You see, Joshua established that so the Israelites can look back and say, how faithful has God been up until this point? Why would he stop? When they recognize that there's an altar that's sitting at the, at, the, at the edge of the Jordan. No, there's one in the middle of the Jordan that was there as a testament to say God has brought us up to this point. Now Joshua, if you look back, he had fought many battles. He'd been there with Moses. They'd been in the, he'd seen God's hand move in amazing ways. But yet it was a significant moment for him to say God's still with us. And he doesn't want the people to, to move away from this place, and I found myself asking the question, how many piles of rocks do I have in my life where I can say, but God? Yeah. It's okay to, to understand and, and, and understand culture and uh, understand a city and understand all of this, but I would rather step out in faith knowing Jesus and knowing his kingdom and have these but God moments with piles of rocks saying, that's where God provided, that's where God did this. That's where God's done this. Because if we look back in our history, and I'm a product of NCMI, if you're able to be that. This is all I know. God has been faithful. Yes, we've done some things wrong, but we have done so much right. And so much has brought us to you. Why would God stop? Why should we redefine who we are? Why should we redefine what God's got for us? But more, let's remember the faithfulness of God. Let's remember the, 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 uh, the king and his kingdom. Let's remember who's called us. Let's remember who we're representing. We're ambassadors of Christ. And if you, if you, if you go on from there, Joshua, we, we know Joshua in, in Jericho, and then we see AI. Uh, the success of Jericho was they inquired of God, and the failure of AI in the beginning was they didn't because they did not remember the faithfulness of God. It's not their faithfulness. It's the faithfulness of God. So with this, with this picture painted, I found myself saying, God, well, then what do I do? I don't want to just do things because we've done it like that for so long. I want to understand the context where I'm going. I want to understand the city I'm going to. I want to understand the people I'm going to. But I, but, but I can't step out in confidence and say, because of that, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. I have to have confidence in who I am in Christ. 
and uh, God led me to this passage of Scripture, and this has been the grinding of, uh, as I've been able to just, uh, sorry, my dad just messaged me and said, preach well, so thanks, Dad. <laughs> just turn the notifications off. Thank you, Dad. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I'm, saying, I'm trying, I'm trying. It's a tough crowd. But uh, God's brought me back to some of these truths that I'm saying, these are the things that I want to fight for. Amen. And in saying these are the things that I want to fight for, I'm saying to, to as partners, as, uh, as, as brothers and sisters, as uncles and aunties, as, as grannies and grandpas, let's fight these battles together. Like I want to come to times like this and know we're fighting these battles together. I want to know my mates in China, my mates in Colorado, my mates in Seattle, my mates all over the country are fighting these battles. We're not fighting each other. We're not fighting other denominations. We're not fighting other things. No, together we're fighting for this. Together we're trusting for this. Yeah, and I'm not angry, I promise you. I'm not angry at anything. I'm just so passionate about wanting to see God do something. I, I hear about revival, I hear all those things, and I so badly want that. But I've seen, I've seen people run off to other things, and I'm saying, God, I don't, I don't want to... I don't want to do that. And I, Luke 6, verses 20 to 26 is where uh, we're going to sit. And it's, it's the Beatitudes, and um, I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, and it's, it's repeated in Matthew as well and that. But as Joshua is sitting on the edge of the, of the Jordan, I can, I'm sure he's looking and saying, what does this inheritance look like? What does this, what does this promised land look like? And for me, my promised land, uh, as amazing as it is, is New York. God's called us there. That's my promise. I, it's, not, it's not your promised land. It's my promised land. Our promised land together is America. And we've each got our own part to play. But as I'm looking at this, I'm saying, God, what am I prepared to fight for to see your kingdom established in New York? What am I prepared to lay my life down for to see the gospel reach a city and transform a city? What does spiritual inheritance look like? What does um, occupying my inheritance look like? Our citizenship is not for earth. Our citizenship is in heaven. We're not, we're not yet to, to and I, I might offend you, and I'm sorry, and you might want to argue with me. That's okay. But we're not supposed to blend into society. We're supposed to stick out. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be set apart. But we're set apart for the wrong reasons. We set apart often because we arrogant or we we think we know it or we think we something better than what we are no we should be set apart because we are blessed by God we are we are commissioned by the king of kings and the lord of lords with this kingdom view with this uh, with this kingdom understanding we're able to understand this this scripture a lot more uh, you see when you read it you, you see blessed uh, you see the word blessed come over over and over and over again and um I don't know what you, what picture you have in your mind when you hear the word blessed, but it's, it's not a good one. I don't believe. Yeah, it's, it's this understanding that, well, I'm too blessed to be stressed. You know? I, because I know Jesus and because I follow Jesus and I'm doing everything he's called me to do, I'm, I'm, the problems of this world, I'm free from them. I don't have to worry about it. And I'm like, no, no, no. We are blessed. We are, we, the, the word blessed is we are made holy because of what Jesus has done. So I'm just going to go through it and, and, and hopefully uh, just encourage us and fill us with faith. And, and this blessed is not an emotion. It's not, a, it's not something we can put on. It's an eternal understanding that God's calling us to a spiritual inheritance. He's calling us to establish a kingdom. He's calling us not even just to be happy now. He's calling us to, to be set apart that we are made holy for a future kingdom. So in verse 20, when it says, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom. I want to say, we are made holy when our greatest heart's desire is the kingdom. You see, when Luke's writing this and he's saying, blessed, Blessed are, are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom. He's not speaking, he's using, again, as the Bible does so many times, he's using something physical to describe something of our hearts. 
He's saying, blessed are you when your heart is not pursuing something else. Blessed are you when your heart is pursuing the king and his kingdom. That should be the answer to this world. We are made holy when our greatest heart's desire is the kingdom. When our greatest heart's desire is to see God's kingdom established on earth. We are made holy. And, and that is the answer to all the questions. Everything that is, I love Amos 5 verses 24, and it's in the message, and it says this. It says, do you know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. That's what I want. That's all I want. That's the kingdom of God. We want to speak about crossing divides and healing nations and all of that. It's not found anywhere else other than the kingdom of God. Because blessed are those who are poor. The, the, the world is looking at the poor people and saying, it's not about looking for wealth somewhere else other than the kingdom of God. Luke's using these, these analogies, and, and we can go through scripture after scripture after scripture where Jesus uses wealth as an understanding of saying, you're pursuing something else. And the reverse when we see further on in Scripture, it says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So woe to you if you're pursuing something else under than the kingdom, because you're going to receive that now. And I'm not going to receive my reward now, because my reward is eternal. My reward is a kingdom that's going to come. So there's this, there's this kingdom, there's this understanding that it's not a now. It's not a, 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 yes, I know we want to see kingdom come. We want to see healing. We want to see signs and wonders. But it's, we're laying up treasures. We're pursuing a king for a future. I don't want to give up for temporal pleasure. I want to give up for, 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 uh, for the riches of this world now. I don't want to receive my consolation now. I heard someone preach on this. And he made the statement of saying, if the mindset that we have is this one that says, woe to you uh, who are rich for your, you have received your consolation now. If the mindset is, it's, it's as good as it's going to get is on earth. That's not good. For us, our worst day is as hard as it's going to get on earth. Because the kingdom of God is greater. There's this, there's this, as hard as it is now, is as hard as it's going to get. Your worst moments is God using you to shape, him, shape you for His kingdom. Uh, verse 21 says this. It says, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. I wanna re, I'm not rewriting scripture. I'm just helping us understand it. We are made holy when our greatest pursuit is satisfaction in the kingdom. You see, some of us have put, and, and, and people around us have put uh, satisfaction in other things. They've put comfort in other things. So they're never satisfied with the king and his kingdom. They want something else. And, and at the end it says, woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. So woe to you if you're seeking, seeking for satisfaction. I'm never going to be satisfied. Because there's still many people that need to get saved. We can have churches all over the United States. We can have millions of people, but there's still a loss that needs to be saved. There's still this, this greatest pursuit is, God, I don't want to be satisfied by, by success and what we view success. I want to be satisfied with you because my circumstances are going to change. I could be in this city. I could be in that city. I could be doing this. I could be doing that. But my satisfaction in Christ is never ending. That's what I want to fight for. I want to fight so I can pursue satisfaction in God and His kingdom. The third thing in verse 22, it says, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. We are made holy when our greatest source is the power of the Holy Spirit to establish the kingdom of God. How can you say to someone, Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. How can you say someone who's going through trauma right now or feels like they're against it, blessed are you. 
Blessed are you that you're weeping now because one day you're going to inherit and you're going to laugh and it's going to make sense. No, we only, that only makes sense in the, in, in the realm of the kingdom of God. You can endure the heartache. You can endure the trauma. You can endure the, the, the slander. You can endure all of that because we are pursuing the source of power that the Holy Spirit wants to give us to establish the kingdom of God. Romans 5 verse 20, uh, Romans 5 verse 3 to 5. Woo! <laughs> Ron, shot bro, thanks. <laughs> the curse of Ron. Um, uh, we all know it, it says, uh, not, not that, but we rejoice in the suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame. You're never going to be put to shame. You're pursuing God. There's this eternal, everyone can laugh at you. Everyone can make fun of you. It can be the most heartbreaking moments, but we're pursuing a, king, a kingdom that is greater than this. We're not going to be put to shame. And I know you might be sitting there saying, but you don't know what I've gone through. And this is ideal. I'm like, I know I'm shooting for the ideal. I'm, I'm, I'm preaching from the perspective of I'm yet to plant a church and this is what I'm hoping for. So it's like, it's like two people coming together on their wedding day making vows. Those vows mean nothing because they haven't been tested. But I'm saying, what are we fighting for? What are we holding on to? When times get tough, I don't want to phone you and be like, I'm struggling. And they say, don't worry, you can, you can tap out. You can just you know, give it up. I want to say, no, remember that moment when you preached that message that it's endurance and character will produce hope. And you have not been put to shame. Carry on enduring. Carry on pursuing God's kingdom. Verse 4 says this in verse 22. I mean, sorry, number 4, verse 22. Blessed are, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. We are made holy when we seek the fame of the King and His kingdom. Because the reverse of this is, Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. We are made holy when we seek the fame of the king and his kingdom. It's not about our name in light. It would be great. I think I'd have more of an understanding if I was establishing Craig Herbert Ministries because it would, it would be wrong and it, it would be easier. But to understand that we are to represent the king and his kingdom and it's about his fame. So yes, I can feel insecure, but I'm like, God, am I just building your kingdom? And I love and I, I, I look at what Darren and Kanisha shared today of the, those ones and twos. So when I'm expecting the hundreds and the ones and twos come, there's this, I'm not building my fame. I'm building God's kingdom into the ones and twos that will t- translate into the hundreds and thousands. But we're not pursuing, if it's, if it's my fame, it's my reputation. Am I going to look good? Actually, I, it's, it's got nothing to, yes, we stepping out and planting the church. But if it's a success, it's God. If it's a failure, well, it's us. But God called us, and all we were doing was responding to God. I remember someone said to me, I don't want to say it was tiring because it was very profound, but it might have been. Uh, <laughs> when, I, when I was processing the whole thing of, of, of you know, moving our family to America and, and planting a church into, a, 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 into a, a very big city, is what happens if you fail? All you've done is it got, got you closer to saying yes to God. All it's done is got you closer to saying yes to the king and his kingdom. If it's about our fame, if it's about our security, then yes, we don't want to take risks. Yes, we don't want to move our families around the world. Yes, we don't want to relocate. Yes, it's, it's about my comfort. It's about me and making sure my name is fine. But if it's about the king and his kingdom, we're able to take those risks. And I'm a product of this. And I'm saying we need to get back to being able to go for it. So in closing, don't get caught up in fighting the wrong fights. Don't get caught up in fighting the wrong battles. See, the enemy wants us to move away from this. He wants us to be concerned about our fame. He wants us to be concerned about our security. He wants us to be concerned about all these things. And that takes away from us pursuing God, pursuing Jesus, and pursuing His kingdom. It's not worth it. Those things aren't worth it. So let's get caught up in fighting for kingdom culture Let's get caught up 
in fighting for the king and his kingdom.